You know, we're blessed at this church. I think about all the places that, uh, that we have served. Because for almost 17 years, I was a North American Mission Board missionary that we saw in the video. Primarily served most of it up in, uh, up in North and South Dakota. We didn't have large churches. Matter of fact, I don't know what they are, and I've been going there for 11 years now, so I'm not sure what the sizes of the churches are, but Green Valley Baptist Church would have been one of the, if not the largest, Southern Baptist Church in the Dakotas where I served. Most of the ones I served in were very small. And matter of fact, I did a lot of work with the reservations, the Native American reservations, working with the Lakota Sioux. We had 11 reservations in North and South Dakota, and we had 15 churches on those reservations. I would go in, I would serve interim pastor in two of them. It was interesting, some Sundays you would be there and and then maybe a, a dog would run in. We would have a heart attack if that happened here at Green Valley. <laughs> but that was normal. That, well, Buster's coming to church again today. So. Or maybe about a three-year-old escapes from a mom and I'm preaching and he's little boys running between my legs. <laughs> One service I just picked him up and held him while I preached so that we could keep going. That would create panic here as well too, I would suspect. <laughs> I remember going in some Sunday mornings and during the winter time after maybe a snowstorm during the week or and and we opened the doors and we shoveled the snow drifts out that blew in under the doors and uh, or the windows and they just pile up underneath the windows there and you get a broom or a shovel and scoop it out before everybody else got there. And I realized how comfortable I have become. And that's a danger for all of us. Remember a couple of weeks ago I, I introduced to you a, a little term called mission drift where we, we begin to lose focus of really why we are here. What is the purpose of Green Valley Baptist Church? We have it on the front of our bulletin. The mission of Green Valley Baptist Church is to connect the unconnected to Christ in the greater Green Valley area and beyond and engage in ministry as joyous Christ followers. I want to continue with that theme today, and our text is found in 1 Timothy chapter 2, the first six verses, and I introduced to you some of the stories, some of the situations that we have been in, not to make you think, well, John's a superhero for doing all that stuff, that was, that was just part of the assignment, I didn't think anything about it. And um, I wasn't aghast if Buster came running in. But I think sometimes we can become very comfortable. I love our church. I love all the resources I, we have here as a staff. Having a person like John Wallace that just makes it look like what we're doing is easy. 
uh, as we say in Louisiana, it ain't. It helps what John does provide back up for us with the slides and all of that. With our musicians, Cindy and Marilyn, that just really, really lead us into worship. I've been in some churches where one Sunday I was the piano player, the song leader, and the preacher. <laughs> Try doing a hymn of invitation that way. It's a challenge. But again, you know, we didn't think anything about it because that's just what we had to do. There wasn't anybody we could call say, come help us. We were it. Or go into churches and they don't have a piano because they don't have anybody in the church that can play the piano. So we sing a cappella. I introduce this to you this way because sometimes we can get very comfortable where we are. Very comfortable. I want to point out how blessed we are. I'm enjoying all the comforts that we have at Green Valley Baptist Church. I'm enjoying all the resources that we have at Green Valley Baptist Church. But I want to tell you, it's a legend. It's a story someone wrote. But I can also tell you it can fit a lot of other churches as well, too. And it's, if we're not careful, it can, it can fit us. And this is the purpose of the message, to help us stay on focus why we are here as a church. Green Valley Baptist Church. This legendary story is about a little life-saving station on a dangerous stretch of coast where there were a lot of shipwrecks, a lot of rocks, and hard stuff. And this little life-saving station was a little more, it was just a little more than just a hut. They only had one boat. And there were some very, there was a few highly devoted members who constantly kept watch over the sea. They would take turns going out into the ocean to rescue someone to, uh, who maybe had lost their boat on the rocks. They went out at great risk to themselves. And over time, some of the people who were rescued and various other people who lived in the area wanted to be associated with that station. They wanted to be part of what was going on at the life-saving station. They had gained a reputation for being a life-saving station that cared about people, no matter who they were or what their circumstances were. So they would volunteer their time, and they would give their money to help support the work. And you know what? They were able to buy some new boats. They were able to train new crews. And so this little life-saving station began to grow. And some of the new members were a little unhappy that the little hut that used sort of their headquarters was so small, so ill-equipped, so crudely built. They thought, you know what? If this is going to be the first refuge of people who are rescued from the sea, we've got to make it more comfortable. So they replaced the emergency cots with beds, and they put better furniture in the building, and pretty soon the life-saving station became a popular gathering place for its members. They decorated it beautifully. They furnished it gorgeously. And they started using it sort of, as sort of a club. Then what happened was fewer members were really interested in going out to sea on a life-saving mission. So what they did was hire lifeboat crews to go do the work for them. Now, if you would walk inside the building, you'd... You see, there was a life-saving motif there. There was a memorial lifeboat in the room where they held club initiations. And about that time, there was a big ship that was wrecked off the coast, and the hired crews brought in boatloads of people. And They were cold, and they were wet, and they were half-drowned. They were dirty. They were sick. Some of them were foreigners. And this beautiful club now was just in chaos. 
So immediately, the property committee hired someone to rig up a shower house outside the club where the shipwreck victims could be cleaned up before they came inside. And at the next club meeting, there was a split in the club membership. Most of the members wanted to stop the club's life-saving activities because it was beginning to harm, harm the normal social life of the club. But there was a small number of members who disagreed, and they insisted that life savings was actually their primary purpose, and they pointed out that they were still called a life-saving station, but that vote, small group was voted down, and they were told if they wanted to save lives, just go on down the road and build another life-saving station. We groan, but folks, I've seen that happen. So they did. But as the years went by, that new station experienced the same thing as the old one did. It evolved into a club, and so another one was founded. And history continued to repeat itself, and if you visit that seacoast today, you'll find a number of exclusive clubs along that shore. And there are still shipwrecks out in those waters But most of the passengers drown. Now that's a legendary story. But I think it perfectly captures what Paul was concerned about when he wrote this letter to young Timothy. We're back in 1 Timothy again. It's going to be in chapter 2. You remember, Paul was writing to him. Timothy was in the city of Ephesus. And years before Paul helped start that church in Ephesus. And now then, his greatest fear was that this great life-saving station in Ephesus would lose its focus, would forget its mission, and there would be fall into mission drift. A couple of weeks ago, we, we saw that there were false teachers who had risen up in the church. They were focusing on stupid things like genealogies myths, secret codes in the Bible, diet plans, how God can make you prosperous and successful and how, how much He wants you to be rich. And so more and more, the church at Ephesus was turning into a place where people gathered to socialize and to speculate, more like a country club than a rescue mission. And so Paul wrote to Timothy, and he said, Timothy, it's time for you to step up and confront some things and get things back on mission. All right, so buckle up. Here we go. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1. Paul says to Timothy, First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people. Now, what, what Paul is saying to Timothy, you know what, Timothy? This is really how Christians ought to be living. I mean, this is, this is what you ought to be doing. Supplications, prayers, intercessions, thanksgiving be made for all people. But it's talking specifically also about what should happen when Christians gather together for worship. Paul says, let's make sure there's prayer when you gather for worship. Make sure you have a conversation with God. Make sure that you communicate with God. Now, it's funny, you know, being a pastor for a number of years, I go to a lot of meetings, and we're used, and when you're in ministry, you used to go into a meeting, and we're going to have an opening prayer, we're going to have a closing prayer. And if I end up going to some meeting that's outside of ministry, some sort of a different gathering of some sort, and we start that meeting without having an opening prayer, I feel like something's wrong. You know, we're used to communicating with God as we began. 
It seems strange to be in a meeting where our dependence and our need and our thankful for, for God is not expressed. So, so Paul says to Timothy, Timothy, when the church gathers together, first of all, first importance, make sure you pray. He uses four words. Supplications, prayers, intercessions, thanksgiving. And it's not just any kind of prayer. He says to pray for all people. So here's the thing. You've heard this before from other folks who have been here. You've heard it from me, maybe not as much as you should. The way, here's the thing, the way that we pray as a church, who we pray for, says a lot about how we view what our mission is. John Stott, a great British pastor, wrote this. He says, some years ago I attended a public worship at a certain church and the pastor was absent on vacation. And a lay leader led the pastoral prayer. He prayed that the pastor would enjoy a good vacation, which is fine. I would say amen to that. I mean, I would hope you'd pray I'd have a good vacation. And then he prayed that uh, two lady members of the congregation would be healed, which is fine. You take a look at our prayer points every week and you see all the list of folks that need to be prayed for because of health reasons, sickness, stuff going on in their families. But then he said, he wrote this, he said, but that was all. He said, I came away sad and sensing this church worshiped a little village God of its own devising. There was no recognition of the need of the world, no attempt to embrace the world in prayer, And then he said, such restricted prayers must never be tolerated, either publicly or privately. Our prayers need to embrace our community. Now, let me ask you this. Say, I'm having, I'm having, listen, I'm preaching to John just as much as I am to everybody else in this room. So, if you feel a little beat up, I've been beat up all week long with this sermon. You just get 30 minutes of it. When we pray, I'm not talking just about the pastors praying in church, but when you pray in your life groups, when you pray in your personal prayer times, let me encourage you to lift your vision above your own life and think outwardly to a world, to a community, to a neighborhood, to a street that needs Jesus Christ. Look at verse 2. He says, when you pray, intercessions, thanksgiving made for all people. He says, goes on to say, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. Now, would you begin to think about this? If you know history... Who was king when Paul was writing to Ephesus, or the emperor of Rome? Who was the emperor of Rome when Paul was writing to Timothy? Nero. Nero. You know what Nero did? He put Paul to death. He killed him. He was martyred. He hated Christians. And this, is what, and this is what Paul is saying to Timothy. Pray for Nero. Everybody else in high positions. What would it mean for you to pray for the Nero in your life? Why? Well, so we can live a certain kind of life, right? So, you know, we say, well, we need to pray for our, our, our leaders so that we can lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. Well, yeah, but don't misunderstand Paul. This, Paul would never say this. He's, he would not ever say, I want you to pray for kings and leaders so everybody can get some peace and quiet and live a nice middle class life. That's not what he's saying. Here's what he's saying. Pray for a society that's not chaotic and crazy. Pray that it will be peaceful and quiet and orderly, which means then we have the opportunity. People aren't going crazy because of everything else going on around them. 
We have an opportunity to share the gospel with them. So we should pray for, in spite of whatever politics you may have, we should pray for our president. We should pray for our governor. We should pray for our leaders. And our prayer is that we should have peace and order so that we can share the gospel with other people. And they come to know Christ. Pray that way so we can freely live out our faith. We can model Jesus Christ to the people around us so that people will be drawn to the gospel. That's the ultimate goal. That's why we pray. Because we love the people that God loves. And we want to see them forgiven. We want to see them free. We want to see them living the life that God wants them to live. And I'm going to tell you something. Country club churches do not do that, but life-saving stations do. Let me ask you. You're hearing this almost every week now. Is there someone in your life who's far from God? Family member? A friend? Who's your one? Who's that one that that maybe you have even lost hope that, that God can turn that person's life around. I'm going to tell you something. Today, God invites you to believe again that He's still God, and He's still on His throne, and He will still answer prayer. Amen. So pray for that one. Start praying for them again. Look for opportunities to love them and to encourage them and to invite them. So a life-saving station is a church that will pray outwardly. Then in verses 3 and 4, Paul writes about the God of a life-saving church. He says, This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, if you look at those verses, you may want to write that re reference down, 1 Timothy 2, 3, and 4, or underline it in your Bible, because that is important theology for us. It's important theology. This is important stuff about God. God desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, there's always going to be someone who's going to ask the question, well, if he wants all people to be saved, why doesn't he just save them all? Why doesn't he just do that? Why does the Bible even talk about judgment? Why does the Bible even talk about hell? Well, that may be a fair question, and here's the answer to that. Because God will never force himself on us. He allows us a choice. God did not create robots. He created people who can choose to love Him or choose to reject Him. If you love someone, if, if you force someone to love you, that's not really love, is it? So God desires all people to be saved, and He rejoices when people come to Him and and when he judges people, he does it reluctantly because they chose not to walk with him. There's a great verse, Ezekiel 18, 32. For I, I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Lord God, so turn and live. Amen. There's a there's a Hasidic Jewish story about this great celebration in heaven after, after the Israelites were delivered from the Egyptians at the Red Sea and the Egyptians were drowned. The scene is in heaven and the angels were cheering and dancing and everyone in heaven's full of joy. And then one of the angels asked the archangel Michael, where is God? Why isn't God here celebrating with us? And Michael the archangel said, God isn't here because he's off by himself weeping. 
But you see, many thousands were drowned today. I think that captures God's heart. He says, I have no pleasure in the death of anyone. He desires all people to be saved. And you know what, folks? I think that's real important for us to know and to understand. I want to show you a verse over in Job chapter 9, verse 33. You know, Job was going through all of his bad stuff, hard stuff. Lost everything. Lost all of his riches, lost his children. He soars all over him. And he's, and he's at a point where he feels like, I, I, can't, even, I can't even communicate with God. I, I can't even break through to God because of my situation right now. So in the midst of, of that, in verse 33 of Job 9, he says, There is no arbiter between us who might lay his hand on us both. Job was suffering. His life was miserable. He couldn't communicate with God. He said, oh, I wish someone would be an arbiter between us. Now you read that. If any of you have ever been a parent and you had more than one child, there were times you had to be an arbiter between your kids. Valerie would come to me and say, Daddy, Gabby did this to me. Well, then you got to, come here, Gabby. Come here, Valerie. Let's talk about what happened here and try to get it settled. Have you ever been a pastor of a church? Enough said right there. You know where I'm going with that. You don't have to figure anything else out. Job said, if there's only someone who could mediate between God and me, someone who could lay his hand on us both and sort of represent both of us and bring peace between us, if there was only a mediator, and the New Testament says there is, his name is Jesus. Amen. Jesus was able to put his hand on humanity, and yet he was still fully divine as he was here. He was able to put his hand on the Father, and when he hung on the cross, he bridged the gap between God and man. He gave himself as a ransom for all, for every person. Isn't that awesome? Every person. Now here's the challenge in the time in which we live. I think most people, at least around here, most people would agree there's only one God. Now there's going to be others that's got some of the views, some polytheists. But I think a lot of people in our community would really struggle with the idea There's only one mediator. Listen now. They'll struggle with that concept. There's only one God. But there are many people who say there are lots of ways to get there. But Jesus, who poured out his life and love and sacrifice on the cross, that Jesus is the one who was bold and said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Now, in order for us to be saved, we would say, well, we needed more education, then you can make the case. There are many paths to getting educated. If the main problem we had in our uh, in, in the time in which we live was that we needed more enlightenment. There have been many wise spiritual teachers who can enlighten us about a lot of different things. But folks, that's not the pro it's not that we need more education. It's not that we need more enlightenment. The problem is, is we have sin. And Jesus is the only one that can deal with that. 
And people say, Oh, you Christians, you're so narrow and so exclusive. And Jesus says, You're wrong. It's totally inclusive. Everybody's invited. I've paid your ransom. Come to me. I purchase your forgiveness. All you have to do is come and receive it. And a life-saving church is a church that proclaims the gospel even when it might offend some people, even when it might be culturally unpopular. And we proclaim the gospel because we believe that people need it. So what is it that changes a life-saving station into a country club. Let me just hit a few threats that makes that happen. It happens when you get distracted from your mission. A few people ask me, why does Green Valley Baptist Church still do vacation Bible school? We get that question a lot. Why? Because we have an opportunity to touch about 150 kids' life with the gospel for five days. And they, you know what they do? They take that home to their families. And we make sure they have different ways that that, got, that message stays there. We send music home. We send DVDs home, videos home with them. To the point where the parents are saying to us, when are you going to have another DVD or video? We've got this one memorized. We do it because there are people that need to hear the gospel. Why do we go spend an evening at the Sharita High School football with the football team and feed them a pregame meal? It's to build relationships. So at least some, some of those kids at school know there's a church that cares for them. And we're going to spend a little time with them. Why do we do Saints Alive? Hopefully, Saints Alive, folks, you're inviting other people to come along with you. So that they can make friends and have an opportunity to respond. All of that's part of our mission. We had a movie night here on Friday. It's a good time to invite other folks to come along and be with us. You know about all the stuff we do. We're a busy church. But folks, we must never lose sight what the mission is with all the activities, all the stuff that we do. Here's another thing that happens. And thankfully, we do not see this at this church, but it's, if we're not careful, it can happen. There will be a group of people who want to be in control of everything. And when that little group gets control of everything, we begin to experience mission drift. When there are control issues, conflict, surfaces. We begin to talk about what we want instead of what God wants. We get comfortable with our people. Kind of, we we kind of like the us for and no more. And when you think about the danger of a church or a life-saving station turning into a country club, we need to remember, and this is what I say as a warning to all of us, we are just as susceptible as any other church to that could happen. We must stay focused. Many churches have started out as wonderful life-saving stations, and they've turned into country clubs. And may this church never forget that Jesus came to seek and save the lost. And He's put us here in this place at this time to continue that mission. No, 
we need to remember there are people out there that need to be rescued. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Maybe you're sitting here this morning listening to this and you're saying to yourself, you know, I think I'm, I may be one of those people that still needs to be saved. But there's where you are. Here's, here's what I know. Jesus gave his life to ransom you. He gave his life on the cross for you. But just knowing that is not enough. You have to reach out, receive his gift of forgiveness and eternal life. If you're ready for that today, I suggest you just simply bow your head. Not the magic about the prayer, but the intent of the heart and the soul and the mind. It's what makes a difference. And just bow your head and say, Oh God, forgive me of my sins. I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sins. I want Him to be my Savior. That's what it means. That's what it takes. And who of us want to be a member of the Green Valley Baptist Country Club instead of Green Valley Baptist Life Saving Station? It's what God called us to be, God called us to do. And I pray we stay focused on that. I'm going to pray. Steve's going to come and lead us in a closing song, which is a song that uh, I think we need to be reminded of. The words tells us to turn our eyes upon Jesus and to look into his wonderful face and the things of this earth will grow strangely dim and the light of his mercy and grace. Father, I pray that we as a church will stay focused because there are people all around us that need Jesus. We have the message. We have that message of hope. Hope for eternity. And I pray, Father, you would give us the boldness and the courage to be a witness. I pray for that one who may be here today that is still seeking that relationship with Christ, that you would give them courage to walk the aisle this morning so we can pray and we can celebrate with them. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Maybe you're here today as a church member. You say, well, you know what, Pastor? I want to make sure that I'm on focus. Please pray for me. Whatever. We'll do it. Because we want us to be known as that, that church on La Cunada that cares about people, that loves them, and will share the gospel with them. Let's stand and sing.